It is my great pleasure today to introduce to you the two experts on today's show. Together, they are responsible for making decisions that impact millions and millions of people around the web. Let me start with Jono, the infamous Jono Alderson. <laughs> Some know him as the enfant terrible of SEO, but he's most widely known and regarded for his skills in digital marketing. And at Joost, everyone knows that Jono is the expert when it comes to structured data, data technical SEO, and ranting. <laughs> and then we have Joost, our second expert for today. And he doesn't really need an introduction, but since this is my only job today, I'll still introduce him. <laughs> As a world-leading SEO expert, Joost de Valk needed functionality on his WordPress site. And WordPress didn't offer it, so he created a plugin named WordPress SEO. And when the plugin grew, Yoast founded Yoast. You see how confusing this is, right? <laughs> and eventually renamed the plugin to Yoast SEO. And what started alone at his attic is now a company with over 150 employees and a main product that's running on almost 12 million sites. And as the lead SEO expert and chief product officer at Yoast, not a day goes by that Yoast doesn't both learn and teach about SEO. So without further ado, please put your digital hands together for Joost and Jono. Wow. Oh, wow, yeah. Thank you, Taco. They get better every week. That, that's that's <laughs> impressive. <laughs> it's always so funny that he does that and then goes off screen. And <laughs> just gets to run away before we can do him. Yeah, yeah, one I, day we'll, we'll yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to say one thing before we get started. I saw someone say in the comments, three Dutch guys doing a webinar together. Well, that's almost true. We're slightly more diverse than that because Jono's not actually Dutch. This is true. Secret imposter pretending to be Dutch, but now I'm comfortably, I say comfortably, English stroke, British stroke, European, depending on where you sit on the political spectrum. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. we've got a lot to cover, which is something I say every month. Um, but here we go. Um, we're starting with some industry news that is honestly sad. Um we lost someone in our community, Russ Jones, who has been at Moz for a long time. Um, I've honestly never had the pleasure of meeting him, but he died quite suddenly. You did meet him, didn't you, Jono? Yeah, and if you're not familiar, for those of you in the audience, Russ was a really big name in the SEO industry for a long time. He was one of the core people um, in Moz's data science team. He was really influential in their domain authority metric, which I'm sure many of you have come across. It's very easy to forget that all of these technologies and all of this stuff is powered by smart human beings. And Russ was um, one of the best of us. And yeah, he died really suddenly. It's really sad. Um, it's worth going and reading this post on moz.com just to get a feel for how significant he was and how much of a gap there'll be. Um, so, yeah, it's really sad, but we thought we'd best um, best cover that because it's um, he's going to leave a gap. Yeah, it is sad for the Moz team as well. They suddenly take, you know, you lose someone that you're working with every day, which must be a shock, but it's also just a mind that you're losing. That's just incredibly sad. Yeah. He leaves a, a wife and three daughters, I think, which is even more sad if you think yeah. about it. So, yeah. Um, and with that, and I'm sorry for saying it, we're going to go to Google News, yep. which is slightly more annoying, uh, but in very different ways. Um, we've had a lot of updates. Uh, yeah, uh, just a lot. <laughs> I mean, I was, this is shocking. Yeah, so we, we touch on this every time there's a big update and we say you shouldn't need to panic. Nothing should really change. However, these are becoming more frequent. And in fact, this month we've had two of what, what they call um, broad core updates. So Google release hundreds of small updates all the time. There are quite often several in a day. Like There's constant minor, minor flux. But then the other side, there's these big named updates, which are big overhauls to the whole ecosystem. And they are usually a combination of 
big improvements to their machine learning capabilities, big enhancements in how they quantify quality and so on. Um, we don't really know the details, um, but we know that some sites will, will win, some sites will lose. We do know that this set in particular looked to be focusing on um, spam, on really, um, really refining how they identify and detect and prevent spam from turning up in the search engines at scale, which I'm sure for everyone here is great news. None of you are producing spammy sites and spammy content. You're all doing great content marketing. So here's to Google cleaning up the index and making a better web. But yeah, the, the volume and scale of these is certainly looking like it's increasing. Yeah, and in many ways, that's probably good as well. But it it drives me nuts every time they put out an, an article saying, hey, we've done this update. And then, oh, there, there we go again. The entire industry is going to look at blog posts about what's changed for the next few weeks. Yes. And to be honest, not all this much, that much usually changes other than for a few, a few sites that get kicked up or down. Um, yeah, Danny wrote a whole piece on why updates are important. It's funny. Yeah. Denny used to be on the other side saying, hey, you should communicate more about this. Yeah, it's a bit, a little bit um, tongue in cheek, isn't it? So there's, I, I think it's at, actually their previous post I keep coming back to, which is really useful, where he outlines an analogy of if in 2015 you wrote a list of the best 100 movies, you might revisit that list in 2021 and that list will change. And not because necessarily any of the movies got worse, but because there are new movies and our interpretation of older movies has changed and maybe some that we missed have come to the forefront. And that's exactly how these board core updates work, is they're just kind of reevaluating that whole set. And you can rise or fall, not because of you did anything wrong, but because the stuff around you changes and the list itself changes. Um, and that's really what's going on here. So yeah, if you've moved because of this, these board updates, which maybe you have a bit up or down, it's not necessarily because you're doing anything wrong, but the takeaway remains the same, which is, have a great website, keep improving it, help your users, and maybe you'll be higher in the next evaluation. Yeah. So I've been saying this for like a decade now, but yeah. the usual answer to how do I rank better is by being the best result. So it's not harder than that. And it's also not simpler than that. Mm. Um, they've also updated the page or ran the page experience update. Yes, yeah. which we've been sat waiting on for a while now. So this is the one that's been delayed a few times. This is them finally starting to incorporate um, your Core Web Vitals scores into the core ranking algorithm. So if your page is very, very slow and your competitors' pages are less slow, you might find that that's one of the things that contributes to you falling behind them. And conversely, if your pages are very, very fast and the rest of your competitors are not on top of it, you might get a, a leap ahead. So it's worth looking at that. We've been saying that for a while. This is a gradual process that they're incorporating, but it's it's not going to become any less important. So if you haven't started looking at this already, definitely now is the time. And we go further. And then they, they gave us this great looking thing that actually looks a lot better on mobile than it does on desktop. <laughs> yes, this is really nice. So we've... If you've been checking in these webinars for a while, you might have caught us talk about the SiteKit plugin in WordPress, which we've had access to for a while, which you all have. Um, it's a plugin made by Google, which brings bits of Google Analytics, bits of Search Console, bits of PageSpeed Insight, all of Google's tools and metrics into one place. It's been really good. That's what this is but in the search results and via email. It's a really nice new piece of kit that's kind of attached to Google um, Search Console that gives you an overview of how well am I attracting traffic from search, what kinds of keywords, what kinds of pages, and pulls in data from Google Analytics to say, okay, well, this one's got a higher than average bounce rate, for example, or good dwell time. So actually, frustratingly, not dissimilar to the kind of data we used to get in Google Analytics way back once upon a time when we had keyword data, and we're only now just starting to get back again in this format. So yeah, this is really nice, but um, I think it's, um, it's not radically dissimilar to what we've already had in Google SiteKit. No, yeah, as usual, when you're on WordPress, you're ahead of the pack. <laughs> <laughs> There's the story, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so we had more. Um, this is interesting, right? Yeah. Uh, they are huge. featuring authors. Yes, I think this is... Um, it may be one of those things that just doesn't go anywhere, but I like, I'm quite excited about this. I really hope it's a big deal. So once upon a time... 
Google gave us markup and code where we could, which we could use to say, this is the author of this article. This is John Smith who wrote this article and here is his image and here is his biography. And the whole SEO industry got very, very excited because that meant we could do things like quantify expertise and tie together authors across multiple sites. And it was great, it was really exciting. And it encouraged lots of people to really focus on how do I demonstrate that my content is written by an expert. And then Google took it away and it all stopped and it all went away. But now a form of it is back. So yeah, when you're searching specifically in the kind of news space, they're really prominently shining a spotlight on who is the journalist, who is the author who wrote this article and what other stuff they've written across multiple sources. And when, if you again, if you've listened to us talk about this before, you'll have heard us talk about how important these concepts of expertise, authority and trust or EAT are, which we talk about a lot. Um, this is really more evidence that suggests that Google is really looking at this. They really want to understand, was this article written by an expert? Is that expert trustworthy? What's their background? What's their expertise? Where did they go to university? All of these things. And they can take that and use it to surface that and, and demonstrate that content is trustworthy. This is really impactful. Yeah, I, I really, really like this. Um... And yeah, it, it, I'm very curious how this will end up and, and what this means in the long run. It does mean something for who is the author of an article and how important that is. Um, so ghostwriting will probably end up taking a bit more of a, a, of a thing as well. I've just seen a few questions popping about where does this show up? This is when you're Googling the name of the author, but I would hope that it might extend also to when you're looking up the titles of their articles or even the publications they work for. And it wouldn't surprise me if they create rich carousels for that sort of thing. Yeah, and it might not show everywhere yet. So if you're in uh, Europe, um, you might want to add ampersand GL equals US to your query. Um, because then you get, they show you the query as though you're in the US. Um, but yeah, that, so that adding that to the URL would would change it. Um, but we'll see. I'm I'm curious where this where this goes to. I was quite excited to see it roll out actually. Yeah. Um, Google is trying to give us more features to show what your business offers. And I kind of like this. It's mm. slowly going in the direction of becoming a business directory. Yes. Um, which is also weird because there are business directories out there that already <laughs> do this quite well. There are, but they make money that maybe Google would prefer to be making, right? <laughs> Yeah, it, it, this coming out in uh, the week after Fumptech in the US got a huge new valuation for doing something not too dissimilar from this um, is a bit weird, perhaps. But yeah, Google is definitely trying to uh, to to corner this market. It seems like. Yes, and I know there's a whole bunch of um, smart SEOs, and to name one, Greg Gifford, who is big in the local SEO space, has been saying for years that you really ought to start thinking about your Google My Business profile in the same way you think about your homepage. This is the first place where people encounter your business and maybe make decisions based on images or reviews or opening times. Google are bringing more and more of that kind of utility content, like reference information, into these profiles. Um, and there's loads of new tools here that you can really fill out beyond just categories and images. Um, nobody's ever, <laughs> I see very few businesses take advantage of it, but there's a feature they call posts, where you can post mini updates, like a blog post or a tweet, on your My Business profile, which turns up in this content. So you can do things like, we've got a special offer on at the moment, or sorry, we're currently closed because of COVID or whatever. Um, and you can really look topical and engaged and on top of it, which can have a huge impact. So if you're running a local business that has opening hours and products and that sort of thing, um, really invest more time in managing this information. It's only gonna get richer, only gonna get more sophisticated. I think we talked last time about them adding more metrics here, so you can quantify the business impact. There's loads going on here. Yeah, it is super helpful. And I think, um, well, if you are a local business, then this is definitely the place where you start optimizing for everything now. Okay, um, Google has updated PageSpeed. This is more your area, Jenna. What have they done? Sure. So um, we've talked about Core Web Vitals metrics and 
the, how they work and why they're important. We've said that Google are now using those as a banking factor. The thing here is that those metrics, the core and vital metrics, aren't a fixed thing. They change and evolve over time. They're being constantly improved. So measuring the speed of a page we've talked about is quite complex technically and as an idea, like what does speed mean? So all of these things are a work in progress. Um, version 8 of Lighthouse, which is the kit which powers all of this, has just come out, and it changes some of the measures. It changes how some of the things are measured, and it changes the relative importance of some of those things. So everybody's scores have just changed, and some will get better, and some will get worse. And that is the game. It's the same argument as the Google Core Web, uh, the Core Broad algorithm updates. They made a list, time passed, they made a new list with some new criteria, and the list is different. Um, it's the same problem. So um, what do you do about this? you need to think about your speed and performance as something you constantly work on over time and constantly evaluate, and you need processes to do that. In the same way that SEO isn't something you do once and complete, nor is performance. This is a living, breathing thing that you need to be managing and earning. It's exactly the same challenge. Um, and then this is only going to continue to morph and get more um, more bitty over time. Yeah, it it, it, it is sort of black foodie magic there. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and test and retest and evaluate, and the scores will change. And test and spot things that it says are now slow and make them faster. Yeah, test, test. Thank yeah. you, Annie Hall, in the comments. Yeah, test, test, test. Yeah, it, it, well, yeah, test, test, test is definitely what you should remember. And also, don't get hung up on one particular number, um, yes. because the number might change on your next page load. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's sad, but it's the truth. Um. So last time we announced uh, Google Shopping integrations into Shopify, and then uh, we meant we already discussed like yeah they'll probably do this for more, and lo and behold, within a few days they did. Yeah, this is really big. You can see in the image just how seamless this is. This is somebody searching for a product, finding um, a product result on Google, pressing it getting a modal where they choose how and where they buy it from and buying it directly through Google via ShopPay, which we'll come on to, um, without ever visiting the vendor website. Um, I think that's a big deal in a whole bunch of ways. One is um, it's the same as the local stuff, is it may be <laughs> all, of, all of this is your storefront and that increasingly people will use and convert in Google without ever getting to your site. Your site is still really important. Your site is where your marketing and your content and your storytelling lives. It is your database. It is your source of truth. It is your central hub. But where people interact with that sort of thing and that content might be over there and over there and in WhatsApp and in WooCommerce and all these other places and bits of surfaces. Um, we have to really be making sure that your know, websites feed this, that we're compliant, compatible, um, because if your competitors are in this space, you can see how seamless this is. By the time you're trying to fight to compete to get these users to get to your website, you've probably already missed the boat and they've probably already bought the thing. So it's really important to be on top of these formats. Um, this is powered by, if you're using WooCommerce, it's powered by Google Merchant Center. Um, if you're retailing, go get an account. Um, it's really, really important to make sure that you're tying into that properly. Yeah, it is. It is shocking. At the same time, I do want to highlight that nobody buys products like this if it's not, <laughs> no. if it's not a regular purchase. I mean, it, it, this works for your groceries or the stuff that you buy every month. But for stuff that people research, there is a research phase that happens before this um, that your website is still hugely important in. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this is for day-to-day -day purchases. If I could buy my to toilet paper like this in an easy way, I probably would. Yeah, certainly for that kind of just commoditized stuff, you really are now just competing on price or delivery. But you're right, for anything where users want to think or where they don't know what the specific solution is, they're going to research and they're going to do that on multiple devices, over multiple sessions, over multiple keywords. And SEO is the, the medium we're going to use to influence what they do next, which means Maybe we need to stop thinking quite so much as a, about SEO as a conversion channel and uh, something with a direct ROI and think about it more as a brand channel where we're influencing what people see and how they think, which in turn influences how they buy later down the stream. That's really hard. It is, yeah, 
it, it, these are well interesting times. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes. Yep. It's also very weird to see shop pay there straight in the search results. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of things there that we that have implications beyond just the, the clear ones that you see. Yep. Anyway, um, if this is something you're interested in, do realize that we have a WooCommerce SEO plugin as well. This is the the very uh, necessary ad to make sure that we can keep on doing this webinar. So please uh, buy some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> nice, but in all seriousness, like this is the big announcement was they've integrated into WooCommerce. And if you want yeah. your Yoast SEO to work with your WooCommerce nicely, that is the product that stitches it. Um, it's also worth noting, this isn't a plug, it's just really freaking awesome. If you have Google Merchant Center set up, that will then start reading the schema output on your website and using that to update the stock inventory, the price information, et cetera, all of which is output by Yoast. So these things tie together really, really neatly. It's worth looking at. I, you see, you're much better at doing it. <laughs> okay. So this was a hilarious story. Mm, I like this. Um Basically, what someone did was put out a free HTML editor to uh, to be used in other people's projects, which would then inject links into their website. Yeah, I thought it was so, evil genius. Yeah, it was. And I guess there's two really interesting takeaways from this. One is um, make sure you look at and double check the tech you're using and the tools. Um, if you're embedding third-party stuff, um, just have some due diligence. But the other is to really remember that in SEO, links are still a form of currency and that every link you give or every link that you take is a form of vote or has commercial value. And there are a lot of people who are building products and tools and commenting on blog posts and tweeting and doing a thousand or hacking other sites all with the intent of getting links. So just keep that in the back of my, your mind that anywhere that you see a link, there's there's value associated with that. And it's worth thinking that through. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, go read this story if you're interested. I, I was really laughing out loud when yeah. I saw it. Um, Google published an HTTP status code guide, which was surprisingly specific. Yes. Yes, really nice. Um, a little bit out of character, as you kind of hinted at. Usually they're a bit vague about what happens if Googlebot hits a 302 that redirects to a 404 on your robots text. And we all kind of go, we know that's bad, but it would be quite helpful to understand specifically what happens behind the scenes so that you can diagnose, so that you can debug, so that you can understand. Um, and that's what this does. It goes into a huge amount of detail on we will follow 10 301s, but if they're on your robots.txt, we'll only follow five and all that kind of level of detail. And what happens if we get a weird HTTP status that doesn't align with our expectations? How do we fall back? You should never really need to know any of this, but if you do have problems with crawling or indexing or your search console account is saying error, 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 this is quite a good resource to understand why, and it links to other tools and resources. It's really nice. Yeah, I, I did think as well. It was a really, really nice to see them put out such a very specific uh, yeah, thing, to be honest. Yeah, good. Um, no. yeah, they give us and they take it away. <laughs> uh, yeah, they they give it and they take it away is very true here indeed. They took away two of our FAQ results. Um, and they gave us back the automatic matching of that FAQ result that they show to the query that you typed. Yes. So if you haven't already played with it, um, we have an FAQ block in Yoast, which allows you to output a set of FAQs on your page. And behind that, we output a whole bunch of structured data and schema, which makes you eligible for, um, which may make you eligible for Google's FAQ rich results. And of course, then the SEO industry went, every page is an FAQ page and has 30 questions about buying our product. And it was a little bit spammy. So um, Google has given everyone a little bit of a slap and said, calm down, you can have two answers to your FAQ list in the search results. But yeah, they will prioritize that based on keyword matches. So it's really worth thinking through, does this page have questions about it? Are they specific to certain keywords and phrases? And can I phrase them in a way that is quite specific and helpful to users? This hasn't killed FAQs. I think it's made it more competitive and more important that you really craft them. It's worth looking at. 
Yeah, it's funny. There's there's uh, another post that we should probably link to from Brody on uh, um, uh, on FAQs because he also noticed that Google only shows FAQs on like three results on a page, even though there are, if there are 10 results and all of them have FAQ blocks, then they'll only show them for the first three or something like that. There, There's a couple of things to take into account there. Um, but yeah, these changes are what you'd expect, really. When Google rolls out something, it often rolls out very big. And then if you're lucky, it stays available in some way, but usually slightly smaller. Yeah, I mean, it's all a testing and learning process, isn't it? It's all an iteration. I think it's always worth remembering that everything you see in the search results is a test and might be temporary or might change or might go away. And if you're getting hung up on specific tactics, like make everything an FAQ, that's a risk. You want a nice, well-rounded strategy that builds out different types of approaches, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. So with that, we're going to go to WordPress news, which is always more fun than Google News. Yes. Um, and we're actually getting ready for another new release. Um, yeah, what we are now, 5.8 5 coming up, aren't we? 5.8, yes. Um, which has some new stuff. Most importantly, I think, uh, a, a redone widget screen where you're basically able to use blocks everywhere where you used to be able to just use widgets. Yep. Um, I don't know how much of a difference that will make to many people on a day-to-day -day basis, but it paves the way for this big transition away from boxes full of words to everything's a block and you can fluidly alter and reshape your whole site on the fly. That was one of the big jobs that needed to be done to unlock that. So it's good to see that coming through. Yeah, it really is. And the pattern directory, um, people are excited about, but I don't really get it yet. Yeah, we'll see. It feels like it's a bit complex, isn't it? So we used to have paragraphs and images, and now we have blocks. And we used to have templates, and now we have full site editing, potentially, and drag and drop blocks. And then you might have groups of blocks and patterns of blocks and direct uh, it, there's a lot of abstraction there i think it will need to, some getting used to to understand how do all these things relate um it's worth noting there was also a whole bunch of kind of minor things in this one lots of quality of life stuff around things like dragging and dropping and just lots of little nice improvements image treatments and bug fixes and it's getting, yeah. getting much sleeker yeah and there's one feature that we really 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 like yes um you, you, you want to take this one because it's you <laughs> like it even more than I do. Yeah, I'm a big image nerd. Um, so WebP, so JPEGs, which you'll all be familiar with, are 20 something years old as a format. Like we've had JPEGs for longer than we've had many of the things that we're used to on the internet. Um, and they're a bit rubbish. Uh, WebP is um, a much trendier, more modern format. Um, you can read some of that on the page. It's a better, faster, smaller image format, which has been around for a while. Um, but has had some support challenges. It is now landing formally in WordPress, which means you'll be able to replace all of your slow, chunky images with faster WebPs. Um, there is still there are still some challenges, like um, many desktop um, apps like Windows, like Mac OS, don't do a great job of handling WebPs on the desktop, like for desktop publishing and putting in files and things. So some trade-offs. Um, and also, I don't think we've got coverage for this, but John Mueller from Google tweeted something which really got us thinking, which is if you just go in to your site and replace all of your JPEGs with WebPs, you probably ought to redirect those files as well um, in the same way you would if you changed or deleted a page because images can have link equity, they can be linked to, they can be embedded. Um, it's worth doing the, the due diligence to update those and redirect them. That seems like a lot of work though. Yeah, yeah, so maybe limit it to your most prominent featured images, not all yeah. of them. No, yeah, yeah, it's it, it, it's fine, but it's also a lot of work. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this being uh, being live and then seeing how everyone uses this. Uh, I'm also, Mikkel already, uh, I hope I'm saying that right, said it in the chat just now. Well, perhaps someday we'll get AVIF as well, in uh, which is another yeah. replacement for JPEG. Um, which honestly would be good because it's a lot smaller too. Um, but yeah, no, there is a, a, a lot that's happening here and I hope that we can move the speed of that up a bit and, and, and start to incorporate these things in, in WordPress core a bit faster than we usually do. Yeah. Um, 
So they did an uh, open invitation to contribute to the WordPress block pattern directory, which is a lot of words. <laughs> yeah, um, I think if, you, if you've if you been playing in the theme space um, in, in WordPress and developing themes, this is worth checking out. Otherwise, this might be a bit abstract, like uh, pre-configured -compa pre layouts of blocks with certain settings. Uh, yeah, again, I think it's interesting, but it's a bit a, a bit edge case. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna have to write my post about a directory of directories because we now have too many directories on your, yes. on WordPress.org. Um, but uh, I'll uh, write that post soon. Um, this was actually some nice news. Our friends at ACF, which is a plugin that both uh, Jono and I love and yeah. build far too much stuff on, um, got acquired by Delicious Brains, which is another very talented. WordPress company. So I think it was actually a very good move because it, it is the type of company that would that can take care of that quite well. Yeah, I've like as you say, I've built so much stuff with ACF. It adds so much kind of architectural capability to WordPress that is otherwise quite painful to do. It also it's an interesting one to use with Gutenberg to build blocks with rather than in React. Um, but that side, I, yeah, I've also used um, Delicious Brains plugins a lot. They have a really nice plugin for offloading your images to Amazon, which can be a good performance boost. So very technical, very, very experienced in that kind of deep architectural WordPress stuff where few people play. Really nice to see this coming together. I look forward to seeing what happens next because this is a lot of firepower. Yeah, it is. And uh, well, congrats to Elliot who founded ACF. Uh, it, uh, it seems like he's moving on himself. So uh, yeah, job well done. Uh, yeah. And I, I hope you get a good payout for it. Um, then we had some other internet news and some of that made me feel old. Hmm. In particular, this one. Oh, yes. I mean, schema.org, 10 years old. I can remember this. Yeah, I found a conference talk that I gave around the time about how excited I was that we had this new toy. So yeah, it still looks as though they haven't updated the design since there, doesn't it? But I guess that's a kind of deliberate retro thing. Yeah, we should we should ask Dan to to uh, well at some point get a slightly better looking site going. Yes, yeah. yeah now is the time. Yeah, no, this is quite nice. It's um, we we work with and think about and talk about schema a lot. We're still convinced that it's incredibly important for the future of Google, for SEO, and to pave the way for a more connected web. It's a huge deal, and this really is the beating heart of it. It's the the standard that has won it's the way we describe all of the data and all of the things on the web which is pretty awesome so this is a nice moment to reflect to see where it's going there's a nice open call here to say um come and contribute your ideas come and extend it think about what it doesn't do well what should change what should be killed or reinvented yeah it, it's nice to get a bit of a, a a spotlight back onto this now that it's um aging gracefully yeah yeah, those social buttons on that screenshot are hilarious. Oh, right? Wow, yes. Full <laughs> cool score. Yeah. Um, of course, if you are serious about your schema, well, we have a plugin that is very serious about your schema too. So go get it. Yeah, and again, doing a better job of this than you, all of our schema stuff, almost all of it, is in our free plugin, and it all happens automatically in the background. You don't have to worry about it. We just process what you write. However, we did just launch a shiny new schema thing in Premium, which is that if you have um, multiple authors or people on your site, let's say there's three of you running your website, um, there's a whole bunch of extra properties you can fill in in their profile for languages spoken expertise, what schools did you go to, a couple of others, I forget, but there's like a dozen or so. You know, yes, you wrote the code. What else is that? Yeah, I wrote the code. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can put in your title, or this, uh, a couple of things like that. Even if there is only one author, this might still help. But yeah, no, yeah. It, is, it is nice to, do, uh, to go in and do that. So if you are running premium, make sure to go into your author profiles and make an update that bit. Yeah. Um, with that, we're going on to shop pay, which is Shopify's payment solution, but beyond Shopify? Yeah, so we saw this in the screenshot in the, just now of the buying things in the search results. This is increasingly becoming the payment gateway and app, the, the app and the system for everything between 
the product and the payment and receiving it. So I, I opened my phone the other day to a notification saying um, a parcel that I'd ordered from some little independent store was currently being delivered. And that popped up in the shop app on my phone. And I thought, okay, that's really cool, really interesting. I bought it via some other third party. All of this is tied together. And then I got a notification saying, we're going to be adding Amazon to this as well. So all of these awkward delivery emails and my DPD app and the SMS I get from the delivery guy who never knocks and leaves it in the rain, all of that is being challenged by this one ecosystem. So you've got Google on one hand saying, you know what, we will own the entire transaction phase in the search engines and then shop pay will do the payment. And then everything that happens next goes to the shop app. So yeah, Shopify is quite a big deal in e-commerce, but it's also quite a big deal in fulfillment and all the stuff that happens around that. And it feels like nobody's really noticed this and they've just already won. And they're going to start taking a bite out of all sorts of other bits of that um, ecosystem. So yeah, pretty cool. It is. It, it would be amazing if they sorted a bit better because honestly, the last mile of delivery has, <laughs> is still like the hardest problem in all of e-commerce. Yep. So yeah, and it's uh, we'll we'll see how this goes, and we'll see also if we get it anywhere outside of the UK and the US. Uh, because yeah, so, as ever, the geography makes it hard to scale, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then in news that you'd expected to be news from 1998, that is actually news from 2021. <laughs> um, without wanting to riff at our good friend Kevin Indig, it is very nice for Shopify sites that they can now edit their robots.txt file. Yeah, which gives them control. To, like So Shopify has had an, a mixed reputation in the SEO space for a long time. Some stuff it does very, very well, including like its basic proposition of get a store online and start selling. Some technical SEO stuff it has had problems with. They've done a ton of good work over the last couple of years now to fix a bunch of those. But the one thing that SEO consultants and the real techie people have been saying they needed for a long time is the ability to micromanage the robots text file, which will allow them to say, hey, Google, don't crawl this directory, or hey, Bing, don't crawl directories with this particular pattern and structure. And that's like the really granular optimization, but it can make a huge difference on big or very technical or kind of non-standard sites. So yeah, that exists now. It's a big deal. It's a big tool. Um, it's the latest of a lot of things that they've been launching. It's really interesting to watch them smash out features like this. But yeah, should have had it 10 years ago. It was. I had a hilarious moment just now. Because you said, "Hey Google," and my Google. Oh, sorry, <laughs> my Google. Oh, I'm sorry, this is funny. Ouch! Ah, uh, yeah, that teaches me for not muting that thing before I go and record something. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, the, at the same time, you were saying all sorts of smart things. So I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> um, Brave has launched a new search engine, which I thought was a brave move. Yeah. It looks yeah, we've heard good. this story before, haven't we? Though, yeah, it looks great, but nobody's going to use it. But it looks good, <laughs> exactly. So, <sighs> privacy is a concern. Google's ad-based monetization model is a concern. Google's geopolitical influence is a concern. Yes, and there are hugely complicated arguments and debates and legal cases happening that are trying to get to the bottom of this and related stuff. They'll take decades, and who knows where it will go. Brave is trying to make a statement and say, we have an ad-free alternate model search engine built by a whole bunch of Google and alumni and other smart people. That's an interesting try. However, it is going to be so hard to, come to A, to dislodge existing Google users. Bing tried with all the power of Microsoft and failed, frankly. And how on earth do you compete with Google's network effects? Like this is the thing that Google's driverless car initiative powers Google Maps, which powers Google's local listings, which makes Google's paid listings for local adverts 10% more effective and cost efficient than they can ever be in Brave. And therefore advertisers will, yeah, like it's so hard to chip away. Like they don't have YouTube, they don't have the App Store, they don't have any of these things that continually reinforce and feed data and user behavior back into Google, which helps Google fix and manage search. Like that's why Google works. It's because all of these things are tied together. So it doesn't matter how good your little standalone search engine is, even if it's incredible, it's really, really hard to get the cut through, but we shall see. Yeah, we, we're still rooting for them. 
because yes, we like everybody trying this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we have some Yoast news. Yes. Um, first of all, we had 16.4, which added Czech, which is Check it really, out. really good for everyone in Czech. Um, but since I'm Dutch, I now think that that is not necessarily something that you want to admit to. Uh, um, next, 16.5 introduced social appearance templates. Mm. By the way, if you didn't get the previous thing, that was a football reference. If you don't get it, that's fine. Football's uh, a sport, right? <laughs> um, 16.5 brought new social appearance templates, and this actually makes quite a change that I don't think everyone saw. Um, so now, by default, we will use just the title of your blog post as the title when sharing your posts to Facebook and Twitter, instead of the, the SEO title, which had your site name attached to it in most cases. And you might want to make them different anyway. You might want the way you share your content in search results to be different to social media. It's a different type of audience, different types of messaging. You might want to do a, hey, 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 click me thing on Facebook, whereas on Google, you might want to do something very different. So having these be separate tools with templates is really, really nice. Uh, yeah. So very happy with this. It was a nice feature. And then today, we released something that I'm super proud of. Um, How was it going? Um, it, it is the first of, I hope, a lot of workouts. So we've been talking about SEO fitness. The idea being that SEO is something that you can't just do once and then forget. You need to work on this all the time. Um, and this workout will actually help you go through. It'll guide you step by step in telling you what to do and how to improve your, your site. This particular workout focuses on improving your cornerstone content and the links towards your cornerstone content. If you have Yoast SEO Premium, go check it out. If you don't, um, go get Yoast SEO Premium and then check it out because it's awesome and more workouts will be coming over the next releases. Um, we are really happy with this and we'd love to hear your feedback. Yeah, I'm really excited for this. I think it's a different type of thing. I know there are there are a thousand SEO tools which will scan your site and say this meta description is too short or here's a 404 error. There are very few tools and processes which are integrated enough into your site and workflow to be able to say, have you thought about taking this step and then going through this process? And here's some useful context that we can surface to help you make decisions. And if you go right, then like all of this is what we're trying to do. Like let's not just have SEO be check boxes that you do let's have it be some uh, a routine that you follow and we can make that super easy it's really cool yeah if you think of yosa seo as your gym then yosa seo premium becomes your per your personal trainer oh, and nice. i um uh, well i like that um then we did some podcasts or i did some podcasts with the ever awesome nicola uh if you are uh, considering hiring an seo agency this is really a must listen i think um another podcast on a topic we just touched on on a lot of eat or eat or however you want to call it with uh lily ray who was awesome as well it was a really nice podcast and we'll do more and more are upcoming um and we have a new webinar coming up uh, in a couple of weeks as well on a very specific topic. We'll talk about headless and headless CMSs. And to begin with, we're going to explain what headless is, why people are trying it, and whether you should even be thinking about trying it, um, to which the answer is probably very <laughs> close to no. But there are cases <laughs> where you should, and there are uh, cases where it's definitely something that could help you. Um, so if you want to know, come and listen to us. Nice. Very interesting. And with that, we've brought back Taco. Yes, definitely. Because I <laughs> learned that for those watching full screen, they don't see our call to action, where they can easily register for this webinar. So that you is stupid. Yes, so you might have to unfull screen. Is that a word? And then click now. the shiny green button at the bottom. 
I I I need to. Oh, that's where I, I always forget how in this in, in this thing I can turn off my screen sharing, yeah. because it Tucker, you probably have some questions for us, don't you? Yes, we do have questions lined up. Uh, also, if you are watching full screen, oh, Jeff could see it fine in full screen. I love that, Ooh. Jeff. Don't forget to click it. Um, <laughs> yeah, then you should also see the ask a question section at the bottom of the page where you can ask a question and upvote others. So we'll go through them uh, by popularity, uh, which means that we have a first question that says, do you have a favorite WordPress plugin to help page speed? I will go first because John I might have actual real answers. My first, my first favorite plugin to help PageSpeed is a good host. Because as much as I want you to use a good plugin to do this, the best answer is a good host. Yep, you're not wrong. You are not wrong, especially for that kind of core speed of like how long does the server take to respond. You can be talking about the difference between 100 milliseconds and a second, which can make everything else slower. So that's a big deal. Um, OK, so bridging on from there, most of the good hosts have their own performance plugin. I know SiteGrounds is really good. ServeBolts is really good. A few others are really good. Um, the, the real kind of WordPress expert hosts will have their own performance plugin that integrates with their hosting. So that's a good one. Um, on top of that, I would check out Cloudflare. They have their own plugin, which makes WordPress super speedy. Um, if all else fails or you're not on a good host or you can't use Cloudflare, um, WP Rocket is probably the leading um, plug and play uh, speed plugin. Um, very, very smart. Um, not free, but worth the money if those other routes don't um, work for you. Or maybe in conjunction, but test all of these things together. All right. And then we have a very long question that I tried to come up with a summary, but I can't, so I will read it out loud. I'm allowed to copy a well-read blog post from another site. I can use 50% of the text and a picture, and via read more, the reader um, should read the remaining part on the original site. Will this hurt my SEO, or will my site benefit from it? OK, so this is one of the oldest questions in the publishing book. How do we do our content syndication that we're so used to in a way that Google gets it? Um, there is no real good answer here than trying it. Um, I think if you're if the site you 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 can do this on, Aryan, and I have a bit of a clue. Um, it has a lot more links pointing to it than the original site, then you might do very well with it. I guess the way to think about this is why would Google choose to send a user to your version of that content than the original? And yeah, one of the answers to that might be your brand or your design or your value proposition or the number of links you have, the quality of links is significantly better than the full content. But you're going to be fighting against that. Like it's not what users want. It's not what Google's want for, wants for their users. Um, you are introducing friction. So you're going to have to add some kind of value or demonstrate that you're good enough to, to be worth that friction. All right. And then there's a shorter question is google my business useful for b2b business yes the thing is um in actual business and this i don't want to berate you or anything because we use b2b and b2c as terms the whole time but in actual business there is no b2b there are always people on the other end searching for you yeah. It's not a business that does the searching. It's a person that does the searching. And does uh, filling out your Google My Business properly as a B2B business still makes sense. And humans have emotions and opinions. Right? If, the, if there's no photo of your business, it's going to be less trustworthy. If the opening hours aren't clear, it's going to be confusing. If the reviews are bad or there aren't any, you're going to be look not as good as a competitor. Yeah, it's humans forming opinions of which businesses they want to interact with. It's, it's no different. Yeah, at the same time, it's I, I, would I spend as much time as I want would in a B2C business? No, probably not. And there might be multiple people evaluating over a longer period, which might make it more important. I like uh, Lynette's 
explanation b to h business to human oh nice it, it is always what it is yes right. yeah and of course that's correct i, I, I want to H -H. I wanna, uh, answer ann hall's question can we take that one yes definitely um does yoast plugins regularly update to coincide with google updates uh yes is the only proper answer to that. I think we showed this uh, two months ago when Google changed something in how they parse schema FAQs, uh, and we did an update the next day to fix it for everyone. And I saw a lot of people whine and complain because they had to get tickets into their far too expensive in integrators to get their very, in very expensive e-commerce setups fixed. Um, if you're on WordPress and use your SEO, all you have to do is click the up update button. So yes, we do that. And we um, at the same time, did we have to do an update for the last few Google updates? No, because they didn't change anything that would be affected by what Yoast SEO does. So uh, yes, we update when we need to. No, we don't always update when Google does an update because a lot of times we won't, won't have to. So related to that, you mentioned update, update, update. Should people enable automatic updates on their WordPress site? Yes. But won't that break stuff? It might sometimes. If you don't do automatic updates and you only go into your site every three months and then update your plugins, you might have been hacked as well. Or you'll miss out on the latest updates that take advantage of the latest algorithm updates. Yeah. I, I, yeah. No, honestly, yes, they should. Um, I think that uh, by now, it, people should be uh, fairly safe to use automatic updates. Um, honestly, this, of course, if you have plugins that you don't trust, you, this is why you can enable automatic updates on a plugin by plugin basis. So, feel pretty safe. I feel pretty safe to tell people to allow it for us. Um, why? Well, because our QA team is bigger than most other plugin development teams are. Um, so I, we test a lot. Every release gets tested so often. Does that mean we never make mistakes? Of course not. But we don't tend to break sites anymore. And I have done my share of breaking sites when I started doing all this because that's how you learn. Yep. Preferably by breaking someone else's site, right? <laughs> Well, no, that's good reason why we're not allowed to publish. Very code. bad. I yeah. can tell you yeah. from being from actually doing that, you feel so bad when that happens, and oftentimes you can't do anything about it. But you feel so incredibly bad. Um, but yeah, now after having been doing this for more than a decade, I I can now safely say that I think we're pretty good at it. At not breaking sites, just for clarity. Yeah. All right. So um, the next question by. Uh, Ali is is Google PageSpeed accurate? For example, I get a better result on GT Metrics or other PageSpeed sites versus Google PageSpeed. It's a really good question. I think we touched on this earlier. The scores change over time, and they might even change um, using the same tool, running the same report twice on the same page, because the server that powers that page might take less time or more time to respond, or you might be running some kind of performance plugin like WP Rocket that might be caching your assets. So all of these scores are going to change all the time, regardless of which tool you use. And accuracy isn't really a thing. That said, Google's Lighthouse tool in Chrome or the PageSpeed Insight tools will give you a more useful, more relevant measure. And those are the metrics you should be using. Um, things like GT metrics, et cetera, tend to be built by third parties, which might measure things in different ways. Use Google scores to understand how Google is scoring your scores um, and keep chipping away at that over time. All right. Now, I saw a personal question in the chat, and I actually like this one. <laughs> Uh, because I can anticipate the answers. Uh, Marina uh, asked, just curious, guys, what is your academic background? Um, After so you. <laughs> I, I tend to tell people that my wife and, and I are on average, a uh, we have a, a doctorandus degree in, in Dutch, or basically a master's. That's because she is a doctor and has a PhD, and I have no completed... Uh, whatever so yeah no um, me neither 
<laughs> it's yeah. uh, free free university dropouts. <laughs> I, I I never even got to university. I dropped out of college to start building websites and spent a decade tinkering with HTML and look where that got me. <laughs> yeah. So do listen to us for SEO advice. <laughs> do not <laughs> when it comes to which study to pick. Yeah. Uh, no. Agreed. Okay. All right, then um, Ali has a, a question that's upvoted a lot. If I'm trying to update and optimize old posts and pages for keywords, is it the best way to create a new post or page and set up a redirect from the old one? Or what are the implications for SEO if the old page has a fairly good SERP position? So this is why we bought a plugin called Duplicate Post last year. Um, in, into which we introduced a new feature called Rewrite and Republish. So what you can do with that plugin is you can make a copy of that post into a new draft, edit it, make it a lot better, etc., and then republish it under the old URL. So you won't have to do any redirects. Um, you can just use that Rewrite and Republish feature to, to rewrite it as though it's a new draft. Um, and use all the functionality of, uh, of WordPress and uh, with that, yeah, go through that process. Um, honestly, we bought it just to be able to do that. And because we wanted Enrico, who's an awesome colleague of ours now at Joost, to join us full time at Joost. Um, but yeah, I just wanted that feature and then we built it. And I'm really excited about it, if you can't tell. <laughs> I'm I'm really happy to see all the positive comments about duplicate post and we'll make sure to forward that to Enrico. Yeah, absolutely. Um so Risa asks, will Google ever make buying services as easy as buying products? That's really interesting. They are certainly going to try. Yeah. And so, so some places they already have um flights, mortgage comparison, a whole bunch of the travel space, hotels, um, but most of those services are powered by integrations with data providers. What they really want to do is go broader in the same way they are with products. It's no coincidence that there is a lot of innovation happening with schema.org, flashback, um, around things like um, products that are bundled with services or services that have recurring payments. These are all bits of data that they want to be able to collect from websites um, and then surface it in the search results. The challenge will be many of those service websites aren't using something like WooCommerce, not necessarily, so the data is harder to get, it's less structured. They're, they're going to keep pushing on this, but it's going to be hard. But yeah, the, the, in theory, there shouldn't be any difference, right? In theory, someone should build a plugin for WordPress that makes it easier to sell services on WordPress. This might mm -hmm. actually be a very, very, very good business idea. All right. So if just, anyone's just ready. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll do a final question because we're almost at the full hour. Um, we've been going on for way too long. But I really like this question because it touches on a plugin that we talked about earlier, which is SiteKit by Google. Um, when you install SiteKit, it gives you two sets of page performance scores, the one in the lab and the other one in the field. And which one should be um, should we be taking most notice of? Both, both is the really important answer. Though I appreciate it's not helpful. So, um, in the field data is collected from real humans um, using your website, which they collect from people using Chrome all over the world, all the time on different devices from different countries, etc. Um, so that is really useful because it's these actual human people found that your website was slow in these conditions. However. If you're, unless you're a huge website, that data is going to be limited. You're not going to have it for every URL. And it's going to be quite hard to test and diagnose with it because you don't have some handy humans in a lab that you can test on. So the lab data is really helpful for, for that kind of analysis, for saying, OK, the field data shows that people are finding things slow. The lab data might give us some more insight into where. We can test things. We can run that test again. We can change something. We can see how the scores change. So you really need to use them both together. Of course, you want to be optimizing the scores for the real humans, but you can't just pick one set and use that. All right. And with that, I think we've reached the end of today's show. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Don't forget to register for the Headless webinar. Don't worry, you'll see heads on screen.
Um, but we'll be talking about <laughs> headless. <laughs> Nice. Oh, you're taking away my joke. I was going to come online, didn't I? Oh, no. oh, yeah. All right. So, uh, and then after that, we hope to see you again next. No, not next month, actually, um, because there will be a summer break. So we'll see each other after the summer with more SEO news. And it will be probably be a very long episode because we have to cover the whole vacation with everything that happens during vacation. What, yeah, stays, in Fra what stays in France <laughs> or what happens in France stays in France. So no, that's going to be good. <laughs> All right. So thanks everyone for joining and see you again next time.